In this video, I'm going to tell you about Zona Alpha and why I like it. If you've been paying attention to the channel for a while, you or any of the live streams like the Every Other Sunday show, which you can see, well, you know, every other Sunday uh, here on YouTube. But I also live stream on Twitch as well, and I talk while I'm painting there as well. So you, you got lots of different options, obviously. Anyway, my point is, if you've been paying any attention to the stuff coming out of my mouth, you know I'm kind of into skirmish games. I like skirmish stuff. And um, this, this episode's Why I Like It game, Zona Alpha, is a great little skirmish game that has got most of the boxes ticked that I like. Um, but it's got some other things that other games that I like to play don't necessarily have, and I think that's pretty interesting as well. So Zona Alpha is uh, written by Patrick Todorov, and it's published by Osprey Wargames. Now, Osprey is not a small indie company. They're a good size company. They're not nearly as big as Games Workshop, you know, that kind of stuff. But they're a company, and they make a lot of these blue book games. Um, if you find a bunch of Osprey titles, they will all kind of look like this. They'll have artwork up here, and it's blue down here, same font, the whole deal. And they're all 64 pages, too, as well, I'm pretty sure. And what you get uh, for your 64 pages, uh, this was 20 bucks American when I bought it, um, is actually a surprisingly good amount of artwork. Um, but also, it's, it's relatively simple layout, but it's clean, it's clear, it makes a lot of sense. And it's a miniatures agnostic game. You use the miniatures that you want to use to play this game. Now, one of the things that this game's got that a lot of games that I play don't necessarily have is background, lore. I'm not necessarily into lore generally when I play games. I'm not all about it. It's fine, whatever. But I generally like to kind of make up my own lore and all that kind of stuff. This doesn't have a ton of lore in the book, but it's based off of some very interesting things. It says, right up in the front that it is based off of games like computer games, uh, video games as they're called, uh, games like Stalker and the Metro 2033 series. I've not played Stalker, but I've played Metro Exodus on the PC. So I'm a little familiar with that. But both of those games, which are kind of a Soviet sort of post-apocalyptic thing, both of those games are based off of a novel from the very early 70s written by two brothers in the Soviet Union. And that novel is called... Uh, Roadside Picnic, which again, you've probably heard me talk about before on some sort of live stream or whatever. If you get the chance, honestly, go and read or listen to uh, Roadside Picnic. You can get it on Audible. You can use my link if you want to, a little quickie ad there. It's, it, the, the audiobook is spectacular because the guy who does the voiceover is just awesome. But it's a bunch of different short stories. The concept behind Roadside Picnic is that aliens came and landed on Earth in about six different places all over the globe. They did a bunch of alien stuff, didn't really talk to us, and then they just like yeeted out of there and just, just gone. And um, they left behind a bunch of junk. And the countries they landed in were like, well, this stuff is not for human. We should not, it's dangerous, some of it. So they made an exclusion zone around each of these areas. And then uh, the stalkers are the people who break into these exclusion zones and go in to try to find the cool technology that the aliens left behind and not get turned inside out, which is another issue sometimes in the, you know, in, in this game and in the, you know, the other games, the video games, and also in the, in the original book. The problem can be that the reason it's called Roadside Picnic is like if we pulled over to the side of a road to have a picnic, um... And then we left a bunch of trash behind. First of all, we wouldn't notice the ants that were there, probably. Just like the aliens didn't even pay attention and notice that we were that this was our, our Earth, right? And then we'd maybe leave some trash behind if we were bad people. And um, the ants wouldn't understand what it was, but some of it would be super cool, like, like just the dregs of Coke in the bottom of a Coke can. It's full of sugar and stuff, and the ants would love that, and it would be great food. And then there would be like, oh, I don't know, let's say a wet wipe that was curled up and thrown on the ground and the chemicals in that would kill the ants when they got too close to it. But they wouldn't understand why, and that's the whole concept behind the title, Roadside Picnic. Zona Alpha is a specific um, exclusion zone, and you as a stalker are going in there to try to make your fortune, find stuff to sell on the black market, and there are people who are trying to keep you out, and there are things inside there that are also trying to kill you. 
So at its core, it's kind of a treasure hunt game, sort of along the lines of something maybe like Frostgrave or Stargrave, where you are a group of, or even honestly Mordheim back in the day, you are running a small group of treasure hunters, and you are going in there, stalkers, you're going in to um, try to find cool stuff and then get out with your lives. And there are anomalies in there that don't care a whit about you, but will kill you. They just don't even realize they're doing it. There's also mutated dogs and mutated like zombie soldiers that, you know, like let's say it was in a um, military base, maybe where this one you know place landed, whatever the deal is. The thing that's cool about this in my mind, as far as story is concerned, is you can use whatever kind of terrain you want, stuff that generally looks kind of modern. I wouldn't go crazy sci-fi. I wouldn't go like weird gothic and stuff like that. But you could even go a little bit fantasy if you were like, oh, these are old cottages in, you know, someplace deep in Europe or whatever. And the, what, you know, there's a lot of different options you have. And then, of course, because it's a model agnostic, a miniature agnostic game, you have a lot of different things that you can do because there's also factions in the game. Factions like, you know, there's military folks. There's traders who are going in to get stuff to trade. There's independents. Um, there's cultists. So you can get a little wacky if you want to go down that road. I've actually already made some cultists for my Zona Alpha, which I really enjoy. Um, but when you're building your list, you are basically building either uh, veterans, hardened, or uh, rookies. So that's kind of how you de depend on what you're going to be doing here. Uh, I'm trying to find it now here. Where the heck is it? There we go. Veterans, hardened, and rookie. That's how you kind of do points. I believe veterans are three points and hardened are two points and uh, rookies are one point and you're basically building a 12 point list. And that's pretty much it. And then you have uh, some weapons you can take. You have some skills. You know, the rookies don't have any skills. The leaders have more skills, that kind of stuff. Um, you pretty much have a movement, a combat ability, and a will. And that's about it, too. It's a relatively simple, um, it's not a stats-heavy game. It's not something that you would go and play uh, competitively. It is, again, a game that is designed for you to be playing kind of narratively and story-driven, going out into this exclusion zone, looking for stuff to pick up, cool treasure, looking to not get killed by zombies, looking not to get again, turned inside out by anomalies, and getting out of there. And it can be played, you know, uh, adversarially if you want to, but there's also a, a free update download you could get to play it solo if you want to as well, and co-op, obviously, I think is kind of built in from the get. It predominantly uses uh, ten-siders. Your, when you're shooting, you're using ten-siders depending on the weapon that you are using. If you have a, a weapon that has a firepower of three, that means you're throwing three ten-siders, and then you have a combat ability. Let's say your combat ability is six, you need to roll that number or lower. So the higher your combat ability gets, the easy it is for you to get underneath it. Whereas if your combat ability is kind of low, it's harder for you to roll underneath it. Um, and then there are also modifiers like cover and uh, being obscured and all kinds of stuff like that that can basically then make your combat ability go down. But then when you hit somebody, then you're going up against their armor. Your weapon has a damage. So if their armor is three, then if your weapon has a damage of one, then that basically takes their armor to two. And then for them to not get damaged by the shots, they have to, on a D10, roll two or under. So you, the, the better that you can do with a weapon, the more hits you get, all that kind of stuff. It sounds a little complicated at first, but honestly, once you start rolling with it, all of a sudden it just snaps, which I really like rules like that, where you're like, the first time you read it and you're like, I don't know, and you kind of stumble through your first game, even if you're just at home playing by yourself, just running a team against a team just to see how it goes. And as soon as all of a sudden you see it, it just snaps and then it just becomes, in my mind, a little bit like butter. I really enjoy the way the game system works. Now, I'm going to be perfectly honest with you. There are, again, one of the reasons this is not a competitive style game is because if you were playing it in a competition, there would be probably some times when you'd be like, judge, I need a ruling, Ju judge, judge, I need a, and there would be a decent amount of that because there are Certain things that are just kind of sometimes not covered in this book, I'm very grateful for the Facebook group for, um, the, for Zona Elf. I believe it's called Stalker 7 because uh, Patrick has written several different games and expansions to this as well. Um, so <sighs> there are times when you kind of, if you're playing with a friend, you kind of got to be like, well, let's do it this way. Or you, know, you have a discussion. There's sometimes there's certain situations that just aren't covered, which you get much more frequently 
uh, as far as complete coverage in the games that are designed to be played in a competitive tournament uh, setting. This is a story game. This is designed to have your group of stalkers go in and try to get out with their lives and also a little bit of um, contraband in, in, in the mix. So like I said, it's 64 pages, although there are a decent amount of full page pieces of artwork uh, lit littered throughout here. Uh, it kind of takes place in a bit of an Eastern European vibe, at least the way that they explain the book here. So you get a bunch of guys in tracksuits with AK-47s and such like that. But uh, you could technically have it pretty much any place that you wanted, and you can use all kinds of different weird monsters to be the hostels in the game. Um, I've seen a lot of really interesting things where people are sculpting up some of the anomalies, like just like glowing balls of energy and cool stuff like that. And that's really cool too. Again, one of the reasons I like the game, um, the system is, I think, well done, and I enjoy always a well done system, but it's kind of the story. Even though the story's not really in here, you want to be paying attention, like I said, so, sort of those video games, and definitely, definitely, if you get the chance, check out Roadside Picnic. It's a spectacular book. Um, it just short stories. You don't have to listen to the entire thing all at once. You can kind of, it's, it's great. And if you can listen to it, actually, like I said, on Audible, the guy who does the voiceover is just spectacular. Um, but one of the reasons, again, like I said, that I really like it is because of that story and because of the model agnostic and because of the ability to have a campaign setting where you're going and getting better and doing more stuff. And, you know, people get updated, people get hurt, all that kind of stuff. I've never been, well... I, I'm not big into role-playing games these days. I kind of started my sort of nerd gaming in the fifth grade with D&D, but I haven't really been into role-playing games in a long time. But I do like some role-playing elements in my miniatures. And when I say role-playing, I mean more like video game role-playing, where you're tweaking your, you know, in between, like, oh, like, kind of like Fallout, where it's not so much role-playing, you know, but you're, you're tweaking this and you're adding stats to this and you're changing your loadout and you're doing all those things. That type of role-playing role-playing I dig and this has got it in spades and uh, you can use whatever models you want whatever cool uh, terrain you want and uh, theme it however you want and so if you're interested I know it's available as a PDF both on the Osprey website I think you can buy it from Osprey you might be able to find it in your local store Osprey is a big enough company that they go through distribution so you should definitely check it out if you're interested in weird alien vaguely post-apocalyptic slightly Soviet era kind of role-playing skirmish model agnostic games one two three folks